democracy, justice, and the methods of social inquiry. With his latest book, Politics Against Domination, questioning many of our assumptions on politics, democracy, and domination. In this lecture, he will use the re referendum elections of, of 2016 to reflect critically on democratic competition. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a book I'm writing with Francis Rosenbluth, who's a political economist at Yale who studies, uh, among other things, elections and electoral systems. And the, this book, the democratic competition, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's, let me say a little bit about its motivation, and then I'm going to give you an overview of the whole book rather than an in-depth presentation of any piece of it. And then in the discussion, we can go into whatever interests people the most. The motivation is really uh, the following paradox, that on the one hand, since the 1960s, in many, many countries it, with um, democratic systems, there has been uh, a, a series of moves to democratize representation, to bring politics closer to the people uh, in a variety of ways that I'll talk about uh, that have unfolded since the 1960s. On the other hand, at the same time, over that same period, there's been a dramatic increase, unprecedented increase, in voter alienation from politics, manifested in very low turnout in um, polls showing very low levels of confidence in political institutions across the developed democracies and the emerging democracies, and um, most recently in the, this rise of populist politics that we see it playing itself out with Brexit, with Trump's election in the U.S., uh, with uh, Le Pen uh, and uh, the, the insurgent uh, populist movements across Europe. So the paradox is why if politics has become steadily more representative and, uh, and more dem democratized, why are voters more and more alienated? Now you could say that, that this, is, um, this is a spurious <coughs> correlation, if you like. After all, there are many, many reasons why uh, voters have become alienated when we think about the growth of inequality that Piketty has written about, the stagnation of middle and lower class incomes, the disappearance of opportunities for particularly the traditional working classes of the um, developed democracies as, think, as jobs have gone offshore or disappeared for technology, the, the way in which the financial crisis was managed where the elites were bailed out and everybody else suffered. Um, so there are plenty of reasons for voters to be angry. Nonetheless, we argue in this book that there's an important relationship uh, that, in fact, the efforts to democratize representation have, have importantly contributed to and made worse the, the alienation of voters. And so the, the main thesis of our book is that for, for democracy to work well, what you need are two big, strong, alternating parties. Um, what was traditionally thought of as the Westminster model, though it's been rather messed up by changes to the British system of, of, uh, since the 1980s as well. So it's, it's something of a, a misnomer. But let me first just give a little uh, texture to the the weakening of parties and leaders that's gone on as, a, as the flip side of this democratization. In the US, for example, we've seen since the 1960s the rise of primaries and caucuses. These are essentially systems of local control over the selections of candidates for uh, running for office, rather than uh, allowing them to be selected by the party leaderships. We've seen the creation of majority minority districts. This was a way to get minority African Americans into Congress by creating districts uh, where minorities were heavily overrepresented. Um, we argue that there are much better ways to achieve minority representation in Congress that don't have the negative effects of majority minority districts. But it's another way in which attempts have been made to get parties to be more representative 
of motives. Uh, the big emphasis on deliberation, on much of which has come from political theorists, and other forms of direct participation in politics. Um, the direct election of party leaders by party memberships rather than by parliamentary parties or parties in the legislature instead of having popular selections of leaders. Ballot initiatives, referenda, and plebiscites have all proliferated since the 1960s and 70s. Again, uh, more direct democracy, more direct voter control in making um, decisions. A preference for PR over single member district systems. People think that PR is more representative because the Greens can have their own party and the ultra-nationalists can have their own party. People can have a party that represents them in the legislature um, more directly, they think, uh, than if uh, you have a single member district system which produces two parties and the median voter in the electorate may be a long distance from the mean, many of the, the voters, so they, they have the idea that PR will represent them better. Again, this is a, is a fallacy because um, it's only true at the electoral stage. It doesn't affect uh, the governments that they form. Uh, per, uh, often tiny parties can exert massively disproportionate influence on governments, as you see very often, for example, in Israel, where the only way you can form a coalition is with one of the extreme parties, and they can then extract a huge premium uh, for their participation in the government. So we argue you really have to focus on governments, not on, on elections, in thinking about how representative they are. And then fixed parliaments and uh, term limits have also been ways of disempowering party leaderships um, and uh, thereby strengthening others in the political process. So that has gone on one, one, in one form or another. You could probably add other things to that list. But the basic, the big macro story over the last 30 to 35 years has been the weakening of party leaderships and the reassertion of control at the grassroots level uh, in the selection of candidates and even in the making of political decisions. Just to give this a, a flavor of the US story, if you go back to 1968, the Democratic Convention is a shambles. This is the height of the anti-Vietnam War protests. There's uh, fighting in the streets uh, because Hubert Humphrey looks like he's going to get the nomination and the anti-war movement are not happy with that. Um, and after, after that, uh, he did get the nomination and he lost to, to Nixon in the general election. After that, there was a big move to reform the Democratic Party, known as the McGovern-Fraser Commission. And the government, McGovern-Fraser Commission did two things. One is that it increased the use of primaries and caucuses. This is where members of the party in the district uh, vote for who, uh, in a competition as to who the candidate's going to be, both in legislative elections or as we've just watched in the presidential election the Republicans started out with 17 uh, people and ended up with Donald Trump, and the, the Democrats started off with four or five and ended up with Hillary Clinton. Um, caucuses work in a similar way, uh, local control for the selection of candidates. The McGovern-Fraser uh, Commission also started uh, with quotas for the representative of previously excluded groups. Um, that would eventually sort of morph into the minority-minority districts in the, in the general elections. So the McGovern-Fraser reforms produced McGovern, um, not surprisingly, who was very far to the left of the Democratic Party, so far to the left that in the general election against Nixon, he lost 49 out of 50 states because he was so far from the median voter uh, in the U.S. electorate that uh, he was unelectable. Politics people tend to fight the last war, so after, the, after McGovern loses, you've got a, a move to, um, to reassert control of the central party leaderships, and we had the emergence of something called superdelegates. Superdelegates were selected by the party hierarchy as a way of kind of countervailing the influence of the primaries and the caucuses 
give the, the party establishment uh, some countervailing influence on the selection of delegates. Um, and it was the super delegates who, who committed to Hillary Clinton early on, uh, both actually in, in 08 and in 2012, and that made it a much more difficult campaign for Bernie Sanders, and she prevailed in the end. But interestingly, um, at the end of uh, the election, when she made uh, Donald Trump accused Sanders of making a deal with the devil in supporting the Hillary Clinton ticket, in fact, you could say she made a deal with the devil in the sense that um, as a condition for supporting the, the Clinton ticket last time around, Sanders extracted a, a, an agreement to disempower the superdelegates so that next time around there'll be more local control in the Democratic Party. Uh, and so interestingly, the Republicans have had a kind of lag imitation of the Democrats on this. So they also uh, introduced primaries and caucuses uh, following the Democrats doing it in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, they also had superdelegates to counteract that, and then they disempowered the superdelegates. So what you found in this, time, this past election cycle, the superdelegates on the, in the Republican side uh, were, were bound on the first round to vote for the winning candidate in their state. So they couldn't stop Trump. Uh, if the superdelegates had, had the same power in the Republican Party as they had in the Democratic Party this time around, uh, they would have been able to stop Trump, but they couldn't. Um, and now, you know, had, had Trump lost, there would have been a big move in the Republican Party to disempower the superdelegates again. But since he didn't lose, um, probably they're going to remain, I'm sorry, to re-empower the superdelegates. <coughs> they're going to remain disempowered at least until the Trump presidency plays itself out in the U.S. and uh, in the Republican Party. UK has had a very comparable story. If you if you, you could you could tell a narrative, I won't do it in as much detail, about the Labour Party and direct elections. It's a little bit different because part of the disempowering of the parliamentary Labour Party came initially not from direct uh, empowerment of voters, but empowerment of the trade union movement um, in the 1980s. Uh, I'm sorry, first in the 1970s. Uh, which moved the party sharply to the left. Then you had a, they, they lost badly to Thatcher, and then you had a reassertion of, of control from uh, the center, which uh, was facilitated by Kinnock, and eventually, of course, Tony Blair. Then you again had a, a reaction against that, re empower the trade unions, which produced um, uh, eventually, uh, well, first Ed over David Miliband, and then the introduction of direct elections for the leadership, which finally produced the kind of anomaly you've got last year, where in June, the Parliamentary Labour Party voted by 172 to 40 to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn as their leader, but the, the party membership re-elected Corbyn uh, by a vote of 172 uh, I'm sorry, by a vote of, I didn't put it in there, by about 61, 62%. And so you have a party leader of the Labour Party that has no support of the parliamentary Labour Party, and therefore they have an extremely weak position uh, uh, to, um, to fight an election, obviously. It's a, it's a signal that uh, Corbyn is way to the left of the median voter in British politics. There's been a comparable story with the Tories. Uh, Tory party, the leader, used to just emerge out of uh, nowhere, of conversations. Uh, then there was pressure to democratize, so they started to have votes <laughs> among the parliamentary conservative party uh, till they got to the current system, which is the parliamentary party votes until you get it down to two candidates, then they send it out to the membership. They actually dodged a bullet this time around because Michael Gove um, committed a kind of murder-suicide in that uh, Boris Johnson was the alternative to Theresa May, and Gove had been his big supporter, but turned on him in the middle of the election and said, Johnson's no good like me instead. Uh, that didn't end well for either of them. So 
but otherwise, uh, what Johnson would almost certainly have been elected by the Tory party membership. Uh, again, would put them in a strategically much worse position for the next election because Theresa May is a lot closer to the median voter in British politics. So you can tell similar stories in Italy, you can tell similar stories in many other countries, uh, but that basically, even though there is this degree of back and forth, as I've described in the, in the American case and uh, the British case, the, the overall trend has been, is to be in a decentralization of control of political parties. So, so our argument, which is, is captured in this idea of the good, the bad, and the ugly, which we stole from Clint Eastwood, um, is that actually two large strong parties that people expect to alternate in power is the best system. Um, it produces what we want to call programmatic competition as distinct from clientelistic competition. That is competition over policies that are going to govern the country as a whole and are thought of as good for the country as a whole in the medium run as opposed to policies that are going to reward your slice of voters, giving them what they want you to deliver to them. Um, so what we call the bad is, is uh, we, I put here on the slide, multiple parties and coalition government. Um, it doesn't have to be coalition government. It's, it's when people don't expect alternation in government that they're then going to be looking for benefits uh, directly for, the, for their interest group um, or member of a coalition rather than uh, vote on um, programmatic policies. One way I've, I've, I think you can make this uh, is by an analogy to, um, to um, labor arbitration. In labor arbitration, there, there are two ways of doing labor arbitration. One is where um, both sides say what they want, and then the arbitrator looks at it and um, uh, does fact-finding and, and usually comes up with some compromise position in the middle. And so because the arbitrator is going to come up with a compromise position in the middle, parties have lot, the, the two sides in the negotiations have lots of reasons to misrepresent their positions, to take extreme positions so they can give up stuff later, they, and so on. But then there's something called last best offer arbitration. And last best offer arbitration, the arbitrator can't pick uh, something in the middle. The arbitrator has to pick one of the offers made by the two sides. That's a, so that's the only choice the arbitrator has. That creates